Praise God. Okay, does anyone know what is this? That's right. That's right. Very good. It is. It's an oiled lamp from, it's a replica from the first century. Okay. So this is the type of technology that they had before halogen light bulbs. Okay. Let's see if I can just get the wick out here a little bit. Now, this is able to burn on several different fuel sources. Uh, the fuel of choice today is going to be olive oil. Okay. See if we can get this thing cranked up here. Okay. So here's my lamp, right? Amen. Praise God. Awesome. For a donation of $19, you can also have a new Gideon's lamp today. Just kidding. I've given them for because I love you guys. But <laughs> for one small one-time gift. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, Papa. Okay, that's hot, Papa. You don't seem to touch. Okay, so this is the deal. What we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about this guy. We're going to read some scriptures about this guy. Because this, everyone, you know how nowadays every single person has a phone? Even old people have phones. It's just whether they're smartphones or not. You know, like I had to talk with Grandma this week. <laughs> You're ready for a smartphone, Grandma. She goes, I know. Okay? But there are people who are much older. I know 90-year-olds, they have phones. Just what kind of phone do you have? Okay? Everyone has a phone. Even we went to a third world country. You don't have electricity? Nope. You don't have shoes? Nope. But you're on Facebook. It's like, okay. <laughs> Priorities, right? Everyone has one. So in the old days, everyone, everyone say everyone. Everyone, everyone had a lamp because there's no electricity, no lamp, no life, no light. Let's start in Luke here. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. Thank you, Lord. Luke chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 8. Let's go, Bradley. We're going to do verses 16 to 18. When you're ready, go ahead and read that loud enough for everyone to hear. Luke chapter 8, verse 16 to 18. Okay, so this, this understanding that when you put a lamp, when you light the lamp, you never do that and then hide it. Never. This is very, you need light to see, not to not see, right? When you put on light, it's for the express and intent purpose to create visibility. Would you all agree with me? So this... This is very sensical. Thank you for this teaching, Lord. Jesus is the most excellent teacher. He presses it in a way that you can understand it. Hallelujah. That we may grow and learn thereby. Okay, so we know that. Amen. That's right, Jesus. Nobody lights a lamp and then covers it up. Now, you're like, well, what about those lamp that's a cover? No, that is so that the light projects in a certain direction. It's not so that the light doesn't shine. Okay. When you have a headlight, you want it to go in a certain direction, right? Because you need it to be where your path of visibility is. So there's a cone. Same thing with a lamp at your house sometimes. There may be a cone to, uh, I would say, truncate, truncate the light path. But it's not diminishing, you know, your, your visibility, okay? It's, it's increasing it because you're focusing the light on a certain thing, okay? This technology is found in your standard flashlight. Let's go to Exodus 2720. Exodus 2720. Uh, Randy, that'll be you. Genesis, Exodus 2720. 
And we're talking about the lamp of the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Okay. The people were to bring pure olive oil to the Lord. What is the olive oil doing? It's fuel in a lamp. Yeah. So the lamp needs fuel. Okay. This is a very, very important component. Okay. A very, a very important component to a lamp is to have fuel. No fuel, okay? What, how does fire burn? It has to be fuel, a heat source and a fuel source and then an ignition or a spark, right? You can't just have heat. The heat at some point in time has to, it has to manifest into an ignition. So you have ignition, you have heat, you have fuel, which is oxygen or oil, and now you have a fire, okay? Let's go to Numbers 8. That'll be you, Brent. Numbers chapter 8. Verses 1 through 4. Numbers 8, 1 through 4. What lampstand are we talking about here? The menorah. the menorah. That's right. The menorah is one of the most famous pieces of furniture in the holy place in Israel. Okay? In Israel, they have, uh, and it was big. The menorah was about, you know, life size. It was about up to here. And the menorah, nowadays if you buy a menorah, you're going to find a seven, uh, you know, six branches and one trunk of, of a candle holder, okay? And it will be gold, brass, bronze, and there's, you know, neat. Now they make new ones out of resin and whatever, you know, decorate it. But the, the old school, high level, holy temple one was pure gold, okay? But what it had on the top was actually seven of these. It didn't have seven candle holders, it actually had seven lamps. And the lamps were filled with oil. This is, so imagine this gold times seven, one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven on a stand. That's what is in God's office. Isn't that awesome? That's how he chooses to light his office with candlelight. Now, there's something about candlelight that's really wonderful, isn't it? Even with all the technology we have, when you really want to get deep, whether you want to have intimate prayer time with the Lord, really deep time to reflect and or meditate on his word or on the affairs of your life, or, or if you have a spouse and you want to relax or go really deep, all of a sudden the candles come out, okay? There's something about the ambience of natural light, okay? Uh, Kevin, why don't you bring that picture here? I'm going to show the camera and then we can zip it around the room. Is that actually the, the one that's on uh, near Knesseret? Yeah, okay. So this is the one they have. All right. Why don't you pass that around? That's in Israel, okay? That's in Israel on one of the public streets. Now, of course, it has glass, but they made that for the third temple, okay? And you'll see, look at the top. Look at the top and look at what I'm talking about here, okay? Verify what's being said here. There's seven of these on top. See that? Cool, huh? Yeah. It's a lamp stand, and this is a lamp, okay? Okay? Now, that was an article, as the Lord said, build this according to the model I show you, according to the pattern, which is on high. Okay? Question. Were the lamps separate, or were they actually, were they actually part of the lampstand itself? Um, that one in Israel, yeah, this one they were, because they had to refill them, and they had to clean it. 
So then the question is, is the whole thing removable or just that? And in, in those ones, are the whole things removable because I saw them install them publicly. They had a wonderful celebration during Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. Uh, I think in, oh, in the early, uh, mid-2000s. Um, but in the temple, I think it was one solid, yeah, I think it was one uh, solid piece here. A solid work beaten into... Um, by the workmanship hammered of pure gold uh, according to the pattern the Lord showed Moses. So um, let's go on to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 105. Amen. Okay, God's word. Now God is, so God says, hey, everyone, you understand this, right? You have it, I have it. This is a light to your path isn't it? Have you ever left the house at dark and you either had a flashlight or wanted to have a flashlight? It's great if you have one. If you don't have one, it's not so great. You can trip, stumble, or there could be, you know, all kinds of things out there in the dark. If you have a flashlight, all of a sudden you can see and you have some sense of security, don't you? A sense of stability because now that there's visibility, there's no longer... The fear of unknown, because now you, you know. You can see, see things visibly and plainly. Uh, and this is a light to our path, literally. You can't walk at night without a light, unless there's some type of light. Well, what if there's moon and stars? Okay, yeah, that's great. What if they're covered under clouds and it's pitch black? What, what do you do? You get a light. Somehow. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to Psalm 132. Quick question. None. That's the Hebrew alphabet. On Psalm 119, before every section, there's Aleph, Beth, Det, Gimel, Vig, Zing, all the way through. 24 characters. We have 26 Hebrews. There's 24 characters in the, le in the alphabet. And, and there's and in Psalm 119, and it's beautiful, they display each character between each section in the Psalms. It's beautiful. It's just so cool. So that's none is the uh, Hebrew character. Okay, Randy, Psalm 132, verse 16. Psalm 132, 16. Let's see here. Let's see. All right, why don't you read 17? Yes. Hallelujah. Okay. Debbie, do you see what difference you made at church today? What if you weren't here? Changing history. Hallelujah. Okay, read that again for, for everyone. Here I am, the horn of the Lord of David, and said of the Lamb to whom I have no occasion. I will set up a lamp for my anointed one. Okay? Set up, establish, ordain. A lamp for my anointed one. Visibility before his path. Don't you want to see where God's leading you? Come on. That's the best place to be on the planet. Where's that? Wherever God wants me to be. Even if it's hard. If God wants me to be here, that's where I'm going to be. Amen. When God sets up a lamp for you, beloved, I don't know that you could really ask for more. But let, let it, you know, except for his love to, to be fully revealed in the human soul. The horn is a horn of salvation. A horn is the authority of an animal. When you get an anointed to be king or prophet, the horn comes out, the oil comes out of the horn. But it's a symbol of authority. Okay? 
The altar, remember the incense altar has four horns on it, north, south, east, west, four corners, four directions, four areas. You have a house, there's four corners of a property. When you have a horn on each side, that's a symbol of authority. You blow the shofar, the horn, you are shouting authority. And a creature without horns is not so scary, are they? But when, no, you know, in other words, you're, you're, uh, there's a calf and a bull. Which one are you mindful of? The bull. Why? Because it has, you know, three foot long horns. The power, the power of the creature is in its horn. That's right. Okay. So we understand its authority. And in this light, we understand that we need the light. I guarantee you that every single person in this room. Look at that lady's carrying a lamp. Did you see that? I'll talk about confirmation. Hallelujah. That's just like when you get out one of those praise jams or boogie you down and you start hitting the, the D, those the organ keys, you know. Come on. God is awesome. Amen. This is the best place to be. Okay. Let's go to Proverbs 6.23. Proverbs 6.23. Okay, okay, Carol, that's you. Proverbs 6.23, and then and Jessica, can you do Proverbs Wow, that, that's deep. Read, read that one more, more time. Okay. Wow. You know, you know, usually when we get reproofed, it makes us cranky. But when we realize we have to grow, well, we're not there yet. We need to mature. We, a lot of times we don't want to hear that stuff, but God's basically saying, Beloved, that, that's, that is the path. That's the, the visibility. That is the light of the Lord is to grow. You know, I'll tell you one thing that's interesting. When you put a light, it's usually to go before you, isn't it? When you enter the room, you put the light first. When you get in your car, you turn on the lights first. Before what? You move forward. How about in your life, before you move forward, what's necessary for you to have? Light. You need the light of the Lord to say, hey, Lord, what's your will? Where are you calling me? What direction do you desire that I head? Because that's the direction that will have peace. Why does that have peace? Because there's light there, literally. Again, if you ever went hiking, you're at night, you don't know where you're going, it's dangerous, you don't have peace, you're slow down on weight, we're in precaution mode. Hey, okay, okay. try it now, right? There's one at the camera. Try it now. Oh, okay, now we can pick up the pace. Matter of fact, you can run in at night with a light during in, in, in a place you've never been in your life. As long as you have a light, you can run. If you don't have a light in a place you've never been, I don't think you would do that. And if you do, you could learn the hard way how important the light is, right? There, it's critical. I mean, I, I carry a light on my personage every single day, okay? Because sometimes you don't, you go outside or you go somewhere you need light or you just need light. And I, I, I would used to think, well, why would you ever carry a flashlight on you? That's one of those things I think. That was just not for me, but all of a sudden you needed it about three, three times. I, I use it every, every single day. I'm like, God, I understand how valuable the light is. Like, like I said, when you, you go home tonight, the moment you hit the light, just bless God. Bless God if that comes to pass. And, and you are one of the people who discovers that you cannot live without this resource. Let's do this. Turn with me all here. I'm going to read this one. Uh, actually... 
uh, after Jessica. You read Proverbs 20, 27. And then I'll take us here to Luke. And we'll, we'll examine the parable today that, that makes this lamp famous. So we're in Proverbs 20, 27. The Lord's lamp. Okay, now, whereas our, you go ahead. Yep, that's right. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The Lord's lamp searches what? The inward parts of a man. Okay. That is a multidimensional lamp, transdimensional lamp. Transparent lamp. That's amazing. You, you know that God, God knows the hearts and the thoughts of a human. And what does he call that technology? The lamp. In other words, it creates visibility where there's no, no visibility. You understand that, that this is what we've been given. There's this light of God that you haven't seen yet. That's even more, more cool. You know, a man once asked me, he said, and he was an atheist guy. He had a really, a really uh, bitter and offensive spirit. And he said, well, yeah, the Bible is all filled with hypocrisy and all this stuff. It contradicts itself. Look, look in Genesis. He, he created the sun, moon, and stars twice. I said, no, he didn't. He created the sun, moon, and stars. And then before that, he created the agency of light and separated it from darkness. What's, what's different than that than the sun, moon, and stars? Is it very simple? Look, look at this halogen bulb. Is that, is that the sun? No. no. Is that, that the moon? No. Is it stars? No. What is it? It's, the, it's a manifestation of the agency of light. What is this flame here? Is it a celestial body? No. You're going to see this in a NASA telescope tonight on the news? Nope. Is it light? Yep. How is that possible? Because God created in separate agency for light, then the vessels that are used to manifest it. Okay? That makes sense, right? So think about this. God has a light that's different than this. But it's like this. It creates visibility at the place that's not visible. And I, and I think that that's really, we should really commend God for that. That should really open up our dialogue. God, you know my heart. You know, you know what's really there. I know what I am able to confide to you, but you know what's not. Therefore, take that data and reveal it to me. And God does. And it's amazing. It, it really is amazing. That's some of the most important matters of life lie in that cavity in the heart that only God's light can see. Okay? Amen. Let's follow me here. Let's go to Luke 15. This is the uh, the real heart of what we want to discuss today. Is a famous parable, and I want to uh, explain it. I want to I want to study that with you, and let's explain that in the light of the light. In other words, in the light of what we understand about the light. We're going to start in Luke 15, in chapter 15, in verse 8. Luke 15, 8. What woman, having lost ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp... And sweep the house. In other words, after she lights the lamp, then she moves forward, right? With what? Searching for the lost coin. She sweeps the house. She seeks diligently until she finds it. And when she is... By the way, what coin is that? You received it last week. The widow's mites, right? Could it be a widow's mite? It's a denarii. What are you going to do if you lose your denarii? Well, now you need a lamp. You got a denarii last week, right? So what's missing in your life? A lamp. Okay. Until today. Hallelujah. Bless you, Papa. Okay. Bradley, come up here real quick and pass these out. 
I got some first century lamps here. Hallelujah. She sweeps the house only after she did it what? Lit the lamp. Lit the lamp. Now, now and in the same way, heaven rejoices, and she, she calls everyone and says, Hey, I found the coin I lost. She's all excited. Heaven rejoices over what? Over one sinner that repents. That, that's great. That's more than great. That's the point of the story. But how did you get there? You got to have the lamp. No lamp, you know, you could, it's, you're not going to find what's lost. Okay? Without the light of God, you can't find lost people. They can't be found. You can't find revelation in your life. You can't find direction in your life. Right, beloved, you, you cannot underestimate this glorious first century gift. It's like I was saying, for this small one-time gift of, of $19. Okay. Praise God. That's so funny. It's awesome. I, I appreciate that, you know. I do appreciate that. If you give to God, you get so, so blessed. I love when people get gifts. I, I think giving, this, I'm telling you, this year, God has really opened my eyes how big of a deal giving is to God. I mean, it's, it really is. Because when you give, what are you giving from? Your heart. If, if not, then, you know, as I don't know that you could even technically call it giving. Yeah, I mean, it's just, God loves a cheerful giver. Hear me. He loves it. Don't you want to be and then do what God loves? Hallelujah. Let's go to James chapter 2. James 2. Right after the book of Hebrews. It's always hard to find James because it's tucked in, you know, before the early and the latter epistles. Let's look at James in chapter 2. This is just something that um, I want, want you to be okay with what I'm about to, to teach. Okay? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you after you, you teach it. Okay. Hey. Well, I'm just going to teach it if it's in the Word. But I want you to be okay with, with this because this is, this is not something that's taught nowadays. The opposite is taught. Okay. So I want you to be okay with this, and I want you also to teach it because it's in the Word. And... And the failure to do so is creating havoc in the body of Christ. Okay? It really is. The failure to grab a hold of what we're about to discuss, it's for the mature. It's not for the faint-hearted. Okay? It's not for the faint-hearted. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says... <clears throat> What good is, is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, I will already tell you that nearly 90% of the Christians I've ever met say, yeah, of course. It's all, it's all by faith. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and fulfilled, Shabbat Shalom, you know, God be with you. The Lord go before you, go behind you, up, down, and left, and right. You say, you can say whatever you want. 
but without giving them the things they need? What good is that? I mean, that's, that's faith by itself without what works is dead. I think that that's quite opposite of what I've been hearing for the last 10 years in the corporate pool of Christianity. And beloved, as I said, it's really harming the body. Because when you begin to talk about advancing and moving forward, they go, go, oh, dude, you're all talking about works. That's not God's heart. And, and you know what they do? They re remain in a place of decay. In the name of Jesus, how, how could this possibly happen? You know, you know the body of Christ is completely forward moving. So it's like, here's the Old Testament, here's the law, law here's the Pharisees, and Jesus is, is moving forward, and you're like, whoa, there, there's no, no next phase, this, this is it. And they stay in the stagnant waters. And you know what happens in stagnant waters? Faith without what works is dead. Why is this? Why is this really going to make sense here in a moment? Because that's what we're going to do is we're going to reread Matthew twenty-five, and this is it is even better. Okay, okay. We know that this lamp is all over. Matter of fact, any time you hear the word lamp, apart from the, the menorah, which is seven of these. In gold, every single time you hear, you hear the word lamp in the Bible, this is it. Okay? okay? From Genesis to Revelation, you hear the word lamp, what you now have, you have it now. Talk about the pages just coming to life. You, you now have everything that everyone else ever, even King Solomon, you mean the most wealthy man that ever was? Yep. What did he use to light his temple? What did he use to light his palace? What did he use at night? You have the same technology that the wealthiest man ever had. It's in your hands. It's a big, big deal. Let's go to Matthew 25. This is the very famous parable about the, the virgin. If you're familiar with, with the ten virgins, the most important part of the story is the, the lamp. Let's pick up here in Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and then five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no what with them? Oil. Didn't we just learn that that's the one necessary component? Oil is like, like works, and, and lamp is like faith. Lamp is like faith because you don't have a lamp without a light. In other words, if you have a lamp, you, you believe that it has the ability to harbor light. But without feeding it and fueling it, it's dead. And how many of you would agree that a lamp without oil is useless? It can't help you. Useless meaning it has, it has no use. A lamp without oil, when it's designed to shed light, without oil, it can't shed light. 
It's like, like a broken light bulb. It just doesn't have a purpose. As the bridegroom delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom. It's time. Come out to meet him. Then the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. By the way, why does... Why would you trim a lamp or trim a candle? Does anyone know why you would do that? It, it, yeah, and in doing, it controls the size of the flame thing. Thank you. In so doing, it, it uses less fuel, fuel, unnecessary fuel. It does as it burn. You ever had a candle, glass, and the sides get like uh, looks like charred, charcoal, little dust, or burnt? What's that all about? You didn't trim your wick. That's what that, that's about. How about a candle that doesn't burn even and next thing you know, it's melting down down the side of your nice nice piece of furniture into the, into the carpet? <laughs> How does that, that happen? You didn't, didn't trim your wick. Okay. Look it up. Look up, up wick trimming. That's that's about the most in-depth and, and broad that wick trimming go. I just told you, that if, if you, you can, can do exhaustive research, look at the original language, that's it. If you don't want to have char marks and you use unnecessary fuel and your candle burn evenly, you got to trim the wick. There's, there's nothing, there's no other reason. That's it. It's, it's to preserve the, the life of the candle and the life of the wick and the life of the fuel. But the foolish said that to the wise, I said, okay, those, those virgins just rose up and, and they trimmed their lamps. Why? why? Because... They wanted, wanted to conserve their fuel. They, they wanted to have something to, to go meet the bridegroom. This is their first impression. Think about your first impression. What, what that's like. You, you should have thought into this. You should be prepared. You should know that if I'm going to go into a bridegroom's chamber for seven days, there's no light in the chamber without light. So I'm going to bring a light. I need to be prepared. So look what happens there. Then all the virgins rose, trimmed in their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give, give of some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Now you know how that happens. If you, are, if you have one of these lamps, you should know though that they don't usually burn longer than four or five hours. How many hours is it in a night? Do the math. You should have to have some extra oil, right? But the wise is answered saying, Since there's not enough for us and you, go to the dealers and buy it for yourselves. In other words, go, go get, get prepared. And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and then the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came on also, saying, in other words, they came back from the market with their oil, and said, Lord, 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 open to us. But the answer is, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, the message here is an eschatological message about the end times, about being prepared when Jesus comes like a thief in the night. You need to be ready to meet him. There's no, oh, I'll be, you know, let me go get my life together real quick and meet you. Nope. When he comes, time out, it's like those game shows or like a test. In 30 seconds, write down on as many, you know, names that start with the A or write down as many algorithms as you can that coincide with six and then 30, 35, go! And you're like, and they go, go, bang! 
And when, whatever you have, it is it. That's it. Permanently. Whatever you, you don't, you don't go, go, oh, wait, let me finish. So you go, no, no, you can't. You can, you can take, I've taken tests like that. They're time tests. And they're like the, the worst test. Because then you feel all pressure. And even if you know the answer now, you don't. So you, if you can't get it right, you can't, you can't go back. You're like, Ugh. Once they call the buzzer, that's it. Once the Lord comes back, that's it, beloved. Are you living today in such a way that you have no regrets? Are you living today in such a way that God will praise your life? Are you living in such a way today that you would praise your life? If you were not you, and when you were your best friend, or you were someone that you were in ministry with, or how about someone in the church, and you read their, their life, and you say, wow, amen. Whatever they have, they're giving their, their all. That's, that's their, their whole heart is in. Doesn't matter if they're gifted or not, wealthy or not, handsome or not, pretty or, or not. Skilled or not, are, are they giving their whole heart, heart to God? Because that, that's the, the grading skill God uses, by the way. There's, there's no favoritism in the Lord. Everyone has a fair chance to move. You know, like I said last week, you get a sacrifice. You don't have to have a lot of money to make a sacrifice. The widow's mites were two mites. Okay? It's like two, two bucks to make a sacrifice to move God's heart. But she had two bucks. You give a thousand, you give two. It's, it's not even honorable mention, as we said. You give a thousand, you give it a thousand. That's the sacrifice. It moves God's heart. What's happening here is that I want you to think about this. If you, you know the bridegroom, how, how big of a deal is your wedding? Big, right? For a guy, we start our efforts in, and we're about 12 and a half years old. That's all we can think about is getting married. And, I'm, and I'm, I've, I've been told it's kind of the same thing for women, you know. They, they are all about the, the marriage and the life, and the guy's all about the girl, Okay. It's very, it's, 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 it's beautiful. God is, he, he was not good for men to be alone. Therefore, he's, he's given us the ability to fellowship one to another. So the quick question I have is, is it, how much did, did you prepare here? I know when, when I was, I prepared for my wedding years in, in advance, literally. But it, it was time for the wedding. It was just, just like all of the combination letters finally came to the right, click, tick, 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 and everything was, was all, it was, everything was all prepared. At least in my heart, the th things I wanted to accomplish, the things I wanted to do. The places where that happened, maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not. But it was a, a big deal. So what should I have done? Prepared for that, okay? If you don't prepare for the event, if you don't prepare for eternity, you might, might not exist in eternity. If, if you don't prepare for something, you might, might not be able to do this as something because it has required. Everything you do has, has requirements. You have to pre prepare your heart for the next season. You have to prepare your spirit. Beloved, if you, if these, if, if these bridesmaids knew Hey, all you have to do is prepare your lamp, carry the oil, know what's going on, bring in the jacket, it may be rain today. Think, think ahead. And I will tell you, on a first, you know, your first encounter with someone, you're all thoughtful. I have gum, gum, is my breath okay? I got deodorant, I got spray deodorant in the car, just in case, you know, we do, do, do walk or jog, jog or anything like that, you know. Go to the bathroom, go my fresh up kit, brush my teeth, and I'm, I'm ready. You know, it's like, 
Come on. When you prepare your, your heart's in it. If you're not prepared, your heart's not in it. In it. Anything, anything you want to do, you're all prepared. Go to your favorite game, concert, show. You're, you're wearing whatever they're wearing, you're wearing. You're not, not even paid. You know? <laughs> if, if you're not prepared, it's usually because... You don't really, really care. Let's be honest. You're not, not interested in the thing, so, so why should I give any more of myself to it? And, and being prepared is not, not just, you know, aesthetically. You, you could be preparing in your, in your heart, learning, you know. It's like when we went to Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of us started studying beforehand. What is it I'm going to be looking at here? here? It was beautiful. Beautiful. And, and some of us afterwards go, oh, wow, I didn't know. Now I'm studying it. Or now, now it's like, that's really good, cool. There's a low level of involvement. But what we find in here from the Lord is those who are not involved were not included. Whoa. If you don't involve yourself, then you might not be included. I'll tell you why. Hey. Remember how I said it, how valuable you are to the body? What if, if the bride chamber has no electricity? Well, it doesn't. Okay? So let's start at this fact and move forward. How are you going to have a, how are you going to spend time with the bridegroom for seven, seven days with no light? How are you going to move? How are you going to go in and out of the room? How are you going to eat? How are you going to sleep? How are you going to do anything? Well, I, I guess we need lamps, right, with oil in them. Now, now, these were called foolish simply because they had no oil. They had a lamp, the ability to produce light without the works to make the light happen. We find the same gospel in James. You guys have been, been given faith by the Lord. Whether you have developed your own faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, whether you have developed your faith further or, or not, what you can, you have the ability to grow your faith. Whether you've done that or not, Jesus gave everyone a measure of faith. It says that in the word. But the Father gives them a measure of faith. You believe this is the Son, the Son, Therefore, fills you, and then he, he himself, where you can't say Jesus Christ is Lord of the Lord without the Holy Spirit, and, you, and you, you can't receive unless you believe, and you can't, how do you believe? By faith, by grace, through faith. So, okay, okay we're living on some borrowed faith here. Praise God. That's wonderful. But what, what's something that is only up to you? Now, we know that God has prepared works before the world began for those who love, love him. But, but preparing the work is different. You know, if I prepare a salad and you don't, don't eat it, there's a salad left, right? I did my job. You did not. If, if God prepares works before the beginning of the foundation of the world for you, and you do, do not do the, the works, it will be like a scholarship left unfulfilled, uncompleted. Hey, I have an extra ticket for, for the thing, and no, no one comes to get it. Oh, oh, man. To the floor it goes. Whoa. Or else, hey, hey do you need a ticket? Yeah, I need, need a ticket. Here you go. Ah, oh, thank you. I mean, that happened to us at the museum. Got two extra tickets. Here's the other one. I need, need two tickets. Here are the tickets. Praise God. Amen. Awesome. But you don't want to be the one that, that, that your name's on, on the ticket and, and you don't, don't sh show up to cash in the ticket. Validate the ticket. This, this is bigger than a lottery ticket, beloved. 
this will of God we're t talking about here. Can you imagine if, the win if you had the win winning lottery ticket and you, you misread the numbers, you threw it in the trash, then a month later, you know, they're like, like, we still can't find the winner. If it's not due by tomorrow, we, it's, it's going to go back into another thing. And then it does. And it's like the big, biggest lottery ever. And then you're sweeping it on the floor. And you find it. And you look at the newspaper and the letters. And it's the same. And you're like, no, no. But that's just money. And that comes and goes. People who win the lottery, a lot of them file bankruptcy a few years, years later because they didn't earn the money so they can't steward it. That's just, just a small example. Okay. Some people get excited when you talk about the lottery. Yeah, that's that's not, not, a, not a, an honorable thing. It's ill-gotten gain. What, what I'm talking about is honorable. I'm talking about uh, the will that God has for your life. Only you. No, no one else can do it. In, in the whole universe, no, no one else can do the will of God that he has for you. And apart from works... Beloved, you're not going to get there. there. Let's, let's go to Matthew 6. And in Matthew 6, verses 22 to 23. Bradley, why don't you read that to us? And we're nearing our close. We have a few more verses. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Again, a lamp is for light, not, not for darkness. If a lamp is dark, it's, it's going to be really dark. Why? Because it is the absence of light. And in the darkness, it is the absence of light. It, it's even more dark. If you have a little light, you know, like dusk or dawn, that's when it's not full light, but the little bit that you have. If it's like, imagine if you're in a dark room and you're in there crying, praying, you know, sleeping, and the hallway lights on, and there's a little, little light, and it goes through the door, and light, it's powerful, right? It's powerful stuff. It goes, it has a trajectory, and it, it's effective. But if the hallway lights off, and your little lights off, if it's midnight, and it's cloudy outside, it, it's going to be like, have you ever not been able to see your hand in front of your, your face? And it's like, like that you're, you're walking and so carefully because that's when you hit something full force because you, you literally can't see anything. That, that's the, the type of darkness we're talking about. And it, it says that the, 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 the lamp is the, is the eye of the body. In other words, you, you look in my eyes, you can tell what's going on. If you're a discerning person, you can tell what's going on in, in my soul. Because of the light, light, but if there's light coming out of my eyes, my heart's on fire, you see light in my, my eyes, praise God, what does that, does that mean? It's all light, beloved, it's all good, good. Let's look at one more scripture here. And by, by the way, why did the virgins ultimately get re rebuked? Does anyone know? Why did they get, I didn't know, know you? They weren't prepared. Now, what was their preparation? Oil. Failure to prepare. Failure to prepare for, for the, because remember, this is, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven, okay? It's not just a, a, a neat story about this famous first century lamp. It is also that. Failure to prepare for the eternal future 
will result in exclusion from the eternal future. Okay? You can't stand in a position you're not prepared for, at least on some level. And yet preparation could say, here I am, Lord, send me. I have no experience, but I'm willing. That, that counts as preparation. You know why? That's the highest thing you can do without experience is to have a will. Amen? If you, you have no experience but 100% desire and you're willing, God counts that in his preparedness. And the highest act of faith is to prepare. Awesome, right? That means no one's excluded. But they didn't have oil, which is the one thing they needed to prepare. And I don't, that may vary from life to life. What I need to prepare for today is different than what you need to prepare for today. What you need to prepare for tomorrow is different than what I need to prepare for tomorrow, right? But all of us need to be preparing in what? Good works. To move in our relationship towards God. To love God, our hearts, our minds, strength, to love our neighbors, to love ourselves. To do the work of an evangelist. To encourage the brothers and sisters daily. To fear your God. Honor, honor the king. Love mercy. Walk in justice. Right? Right? Walk in injustice, love mercy, be graceful, be forgiving, forgive those as you were forgiven. These are th things that are works that we need to work towards. Be, be baptized, give to God, take, take time to pray and fast. These, beloved, these are, these are all, you, you could call them works, sell your, your all legalistic, no, no, beloved. You know that Abraham was justified by his works. He's also justified by his faith, but faith that works is dead. That's why it says that in Hebrews that Abraham was actually justified by his works. When you're in a car, you turn on the light and you follow the path. The light goes before you. When you go home home at night, you turn on the light, the light goes before you. Jesus is the light. Let's go, go to John 8, 12. Amber, why don't you read John 8, 12. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Amen. But have the light of life. Beloved, Jesus is the light of the world. He is our lamp. He goes before us. If you, you follow him, you won't walk in darkness. Now, you, you all use, uh, that's, uh, as I'm saying, this is, this is a great teaching from, from the Lord because you will all walk in the light, whether you, you realize it or not. You all use lights at night. As a matter of fact, if you, if you don't, it's illegal, and when you get a ticket, so it's, it's like I guarantee you use lights when you drive. Guarantee it. I guarantee every single person in this, this room, in the whole whole state of Colorado, when they go home to tonight. If they have a light, they're going to turn it on. Because if not, they can't, can't see. Period. Okay? With, with the exception of, you know, 5% of the people. Okay? They could be blind, or maybe they're in a 
in the hospital bed and they can't turn, turn light, but someone else does. You know what I'm saying? And if not, God turns on the light. What's that? The moon, the sun, the stars. Just think about how important this is to have Jesus Christ going before you, you to light your path. Now, in Christianity, you see, some people don't, don't do that. They believe in God, but they don't, they don't seek him as the light. In other words, I understand if I don't turn on the light, I'm in darkness. In other words, hey, hey it's a new situation. It's a new season. It's a new circumstance. I better turn on the light. What does that mean? Jesus, shine your light on this. What is my, my job here? Hey, I'm going to go on the mission field. What, what exactly is my mission, Lord? Hey, I'm in a relationship. Is, is this from you or not? Hey, I'm, I'm about to serve. This is, is your... Is this your command or not? And the Lord says, yes. And you say, praise God. Now, now I have light. I can be, be at peace. The relationship is that from me. It's going to lead to marriage. Amen. What does that mean? I will move forward. Praise God for his light. But you know what we need? We need oil. We need oil. Now, I told you, Abraham... I've heard people say this. I've even told people, hey, you need to get, get baptized if you believe in the Lord. You need to get baptized and in, in, in receive salvation. And say, oh, no, you don't have to do that. It's not by works. Abraham was justified by faith. Okay, great. Guess what he's also justified by? Go with me to James chapter 2, verse 21. Like I said, I know that this is not taught commonly. There's a lot of people that would shun right now what I'm telling you, but they're not shunning me. They're shunning the author of the New Testament. Because in James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? What? Can you honestly tell me I'm justified by works? Yep. Yes, I can. And then I can tell you that you will be too. Now, that, that's not how you get saved. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. Why is that? So that, that way you, you can't boast. You're saved by the grace through faith. That way you can't brag. My works are different than yours, better than yours. There's, no, no, that's not. God doesn't measure that way. He measures, are your works preparations for your destiny? Preparations for your future. In other words, if you're going to be the fastest man in the world, are you eating donuts and going shopping at the mall? Or are you sprinting around the track and eating a tablespoon of yogurt and then granola? It's like, how good do you want to be? It's up to you. You know what I'm saying? How are you preparing for, you know, listen, you're going to church. And you know that after life, there's only God. So, so keep him in mind. Now, the virgins, did they have to pay taxes? Yes. I'm sure there's lawful citizens of Judea. They, they even had to pay taxes to, to Caesar. If you want to be real technically accurate. And, and as a matter of fact, I'll go a little further to say that they all had to eat. They, they all had to sleep. They all wore clothes. You guys follow me? There's, there's a lot of, man, there's all this stuff to do. What do I focus on? What's going to be commanded out of you? What's the grading scale? Well, that's tonight. I'll need my light. I should prepare for that. You're coming to church. How do I prepare for church? Bring in your whole heart. Read your Bible. Give of your income. Give of your heart and encourage people. Take a fast. Participate with what we do. Know that if God's called you here, if God called you to the banquet, be prepared for, for the banquet. If God's called you into to his kingdom, be prepared for his kingdom. What, what if I don't know what that looks like? Sit down with, with a mature believer. Pray together. How about this? Lord, what are you asking of me? Amen. Well, again, we already know a lot of it. Right? If you have God's virtue in your heart, 
and you are in any situation in life, it's already, you already have your work cut out for you. To be the light, to be the salt, to bless when others curse, to lift up when others pull down, to uh, and encourage when others discourage. When they dishonor you, to, to, to hope, to pray for them. And there's a lot of things. And we do that here. here. All you have to do is connect to the train. Beloved, we're already moving towards heaven. All you got to do is sync up. Let your Bluetooth sync up with the will of God. It's happening right here. This is the expression of God. It's the church. That is the expression of God. Abraham was justified by thy works when he offered up Isaac on the altar. You know what that's called? Obedience. A work is, so if Jesus says get, get baptized, you get baptized, that's a work of obedience. When you obey God, that, that's a work. We don't have to be afraid of this language anymore. We're not saying you have to earn anything. Or you have to do something before God loves you. That's not what it says. But it does say you're, you're justified by your works. Why? Because faith without them is dead. Faith without works is as oil, a lamp without oil. Okay? But like I said, you know what my heart is for this church? You know what God's heart is for his church? We, we want to be balanced. We don't want to be all, all grace, and we don't want to be all works, because it's not all grace. Grace without works, faith without works, right? right? Works without grace, without our faith, nope, they're all together. We, we don't have to separate stuff God doesn't separate. We can have our cake and eat it too. Isn't that awesome? So what's missing in your, your life today? Oil. I got the lamp. I need the oil. Okay. Debbie, we pass this oil out. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus is the light of the world. Let's close our Bibles. I want to, to I know it's one, whatever, one, one, ten. I want to just sing one more.